Hello and welcome. All right, so today we are doing another really long set of slides. Um, again, this is based on the fact that normally I would do life science flashback as journal questions all throughout the year, and we just did not get to it. We just did not have time. So um, we're going to have to to do all of the seventh grade journals as part of our lesson today. So um, we're only going to do two things for days 60, where are we at? 62 and 63. We're only going to do two things, this journal and then a dragon genetics thing. So this is going to take some time. So buckle up. All right. So um, you are going to change copy of up in the bar up here. It'll say copy of once you make a copy. Um, in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and click and make a copy so that you can see what you got to do. So it's going to force you to do this. You're not going to have to do all this clicking. When you click on the link in the folder, it's going to make a copy for you. Well, it's going to give you a little thing that says you have to make a copy and you can click the button. Now that we have our copy made, up here in the title where it says copy of, you're going to change copy of to your name. You also down here where it says your name can put your name on it. But I, the best thing for me, the thing that I would prefer is that up here in the title, once it's loaded, you're just going to erase copy of and change it to whatever your name is. You're not going to write your name. You're going to write your actual name, right? Right. Okay. All right. So question one is what is the main difference between a frog and a bee? So normally uh, I ask this question and I get, you know, one flies. Um, I get that one's a, uh, all sorts of different things. And, and they're all true, but the question is, what's the main difference between a frog and a bee? So um, the way to think about that is classification. So where is the, the point of classification where a frog and a bee split? That's going to be the main difference between them, right? I mean, there's lots of differences. Uh, you know, one's got bones, one um, hops and has, has, a dewy skin uh, and the babies are, are born in the water and have to grow legs. And then the other one um, has to pupate within a, within a little cell and a little egg, almost like a butterfly turns into something new. You have larva and the whole thing. So there's so many differences. So what's the main difference? What's the first difference? Well, you've got to think about, you've got to think about how we do classification. So when we're working on classification, domain is the first layer of classification. And that's all uh, the, the ancient bacteria, the archaeobacteria are in its own domain. And then everything else is in the eukaryotic domain. Um, so we, we know that everything, we know that both a frog and a bee are in the same domain. <clears throat> that's going to take a minute to pop up, but it will be there. <clears throat> all right. And so then the next thing is kingdom. Now we're going to go ahead and review all the levels of classification, even though we've done this before, just because it's a good habit to be in. So say them with me, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. One more time. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Uh, Kate pu cucumbers on father's or Fred's or Frank's green shirt uh, is the way to remember that. So they're in the same domain. And then kingdom. All right, well, let's see. Well, the bee is in the animal kingdom. And the frog is also in the animal kingdom. So that's not it. That's not the main difference. So we come down. Domain, kingdom. What's next? Phylum. All right, well, the frog is in the phylum chordata. And those are the chordates. Those are the things that have a spinal cord inside a backbone. So these are all of the animals that have a spinal cord inside of a backbone. They are the vertebrates. And then the bee is in a phylum called arthropoda which is means jointed foot nudge nudge wink wink remember that for later it means jointed foot jointed feet hoed means feet like podiatrist is a foot doctor and arthro means joints like arthritis so arthropods are means they have jointed feet all right well there's the split they're not in the same place anymore 
So then what is the main difference between a frog and a bee? Frog has a backbone and a bee does not. So frog has a backbone. It's a vertebrate. And a bee is an invertebrate. No backbone. All right, you're going to type that into the text box that's there on the slides when you've got it open. And you can pause, of course, to write down whatever you need, but we're going to move on to the next one. All right, the next question is, what would be some reasons that a prairie dog population would increase or decrease? So what would cause a prairie dog population to increase? What are some things that would happen that could make the population of anything really, but we're talking about prairie dogs. So, all right, think about it. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to get more babies if they have more land or if they have less predators. If they have less things chasing after them and eating them, then they're going to have more babies. If there's more food available, then there's going to be more babies. It's just more resources, period, means you're going to be able to have more babies. What about decrease? What's going to bring down the population? Well, just like more land made an increase, less land, less territory. If they've got less of an area to move around in, they're not going to have as many babies. They don't have enough places for the homes. More predators. So just like less predators meant that we're going to have more babies. If we have more predators, we're going to have less babies. And then if we're lacking resources, if, if the water dries up and if the food source goes away, um, if the home collapses, all of those things are going to cause the population to go down. Oh, and disease. Uh, an increase, uh, well, just, just disease period will cause the population to go down. If, uh, if you know, some prairie dog catches something and then gives it to the rest of the, of the prairie dogs, it's going to bring the population down. All right, again, pause it to type that into your box, but I'm going to move on. All right, so the next question I told you to, to remember from the last one, because I wanted to know what are arthropods? And I told you what they were in the last one. Now I've got a, a on the next slide, those are all arthropods. And they couldn't look more different, right? But what do they all have in common? Those what now? What does arthro mean? Right? Joints. And what does pod mean? Foot. So arthropods means jointed feet. So they are animals, because we know they're in the animal kingdom. They are, they don't have a backbone, so they're animals without backbones. So they're going to be invertebrates. They're going to have an exoskeleton, a segmented body. So they're going to have that head, thorax, abdomen, like an ant or a bee or a wasp, segmented body and limbs. So both their their um, body and their limbs are in segments. If you look at a, a, a tick leg, for example, it's in these little segments. And the biggest thing is jointed appendages, jointed feet, jointed feet. Um, because that's where the name comes from, is arthropod, jointed foot. So that's the thing that really matters. So <clears throat> most, if you think of an invertebrate, most likely you're thinking of an arthropod. Um, there's very few invertebrates that aren't arthropods. Most of them are. Most of them are either insects or arachnids or crustaceans. Um, there are some invertebrates, of course, that are not arthropods. Um, bivalves, oysters and mussels and things are not arthropods. Um, uh, squid is not an arthropod. Uh, octopus is not an arthropod. 
Um, jellyfish are not arthropods. Sponges are not arthropods. Worms are not arthropods. So there are some that aren't, but most of the time, if you think, think of as something that doesn't have a backbone, you're going to think of a bee, an ant, a butterfly, uh, a shrimp, and all of those things are arthropods. All right, again, pause it to write that down. And we're going to move on. wonder why it's doing that weird, like, you see that? Isn't that weird? Why is it doing that? I must have put some kind of an animation in it that I didn't realize I'd done. All right, so I want you to put this in order from smallest to biggest. So we've got community, biosphere, population, organism, ecosystem, and biome. And you need to put those in order. So you're going to retype them down into the box. So what's the smallest thing that's up there? That's right, the organism, the single living organism. All right, we use that one. If we have a group of the same type of organism, we have a population. So that's gonna be like, um, if I go outside and I spot a blue jay, that's the single organism. And then all of the blue jays that are living in the area are the population of the blue jays. We use that one. All right, the next thing is community. That's going to be the blue jays and all of the other living things in the area. So the blue jays as well as the um, worms and the mice and the uh, groundhogs and the raccoons and all the bugs that are there and just anything that's living in the area. Um, it also includes the um, plants that are in the areas because they're alive too. So the trees and the grass and everything. All right. So now that we've got all the living things, now we need to include the non-living things. And that's where we get to ecosystem. So now we've got all of the living things, all the plants, all the animals. But then we also have on oh, the fungi and everything. But then we also have the dirt and the rocks and the water and the air and all of that stuff. That gets included when we get to ecosystem. Then next up is biome. So if you've got an area where you put a bunch of different ecosystems together that all have the same or similar animals, characteristics, weather, climate, blah, 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 that's a biome. So you have large areas that have the same ecosystems, just a bunch of different ecosystems that are pretty much the same. That's when you have a biome. And then if you put a bunch of different biomes together, you get the biosphere, which literally means life ball. Like that's what it means. Sphere means ball, bio means living. So living ball, that's what the earth is. It's the biosphere. It is a living sphere. That's, that's what we've got here on our earth. Isn't that cool? I can't write earth today. And of course you don't have to draw that part either. All right. Get these written down in that order into the box, and then we'll move on. All right, tell me what you know about a plant cell versus an animal cell. So this is, I just want you to do a brain dump. Tell me what you know about a plant cell versus an animal cell. Um, of course, uh, you know, I want to give you the correct answers to make sure you write them down, but really just make sure you just brain dump about plant cells and animal cells. So plant cells have some things that animal cells do not. What are they? Right. So plant cells have chloroplasts and the chloroplasts are where, where the chlorophyll is and that's where photosynthesis takes place. So plants have those and animal cells do not. All right, there's something else that plant cells have that animal cells do not. What's that? Yes, a cell wall. So plant cells have rigid cell walls. Animal cells do not. Animal cells are squishy. They just have that cell membrane, and they don't have that rigid outer layer of chitin like plant cells do. All right, and then there's one more thing that plant cells have that animal cells don't. Now, it's something that animal cells have, just not the same. Do you know? Good job. 
Plant cells have a large central vacuole. And that stores, stores water. Animal cells have small vacuoles, not one big one in the middle. All right, so pause that if you need to write that down, but I, of course, am going to erase that and go ahead and advance to the next slide because I want to show you a plant cell and an animal cell. So this is the vacuole that I'm talking about right here, this large central vacuole that's in a plant cell. So um, that makes it so that plants have a bit of stored water, and then when they use up the water, they wilt. So it's because that collapses. So that vacuole that was full of water is now empty, and so the cell collapses. And when you've got a bunch of different cells that have all collapsed, you get a wilted plant. As long as it's not dead, all you got to do is water it. It'll stand right back up because those vacuoles will fill back up. Now, I also want you to take a minute to look at some of the other things that are going on here because, um, you know, you do need to, you need to recognize some of these, these uh, organelles. So um, we've got the organelles uh, for an animal cell over here on this side. And um, as you can see, the animal cell is round because it doesn't have this rigid cell wall. And then the animal cell, um, they both have a nucleus. The animal cell doesn't have chloroplasts. We don't have any of those over here. Um, but everything else is pretty much the same. Um, and that's because cells work in pretty much the same way. You've got to have cytoplasm, which is the jelly for everything to float in. You've got to have the nucleus, which is the brain and controls all the activities. You've got to have vacuoles, which sell, uh, store water. You've got to have um, the rough ER and the smooth ER that are those little protein factories. Um, the Golgi body, which packages those proteins and sends them where they need to go. And the mighty, mighty mitochondrion that is the, really the powerhouse of the cell. It's where cellular respiration takes place, where it breaks down your food and releases energy. So that's why it's called the powerhouse of the cell. Okay, remember all that or go back to it in a minute because you're going to need it. So the next question is... Going to pop up at some point. I feel like we missed one. Yeah, I thought so. All right, so like I said, you're going to need it. What are organelles? Name at least three. So I just told you what organelles are, but now we're going to write it down. Organelles are? Right. So it's like organs. So organelles are the parts of structure and fu function of the cell. And then you're going to go back to that prior slide and write down a couple. Um, you got to name at least three. Um, what can you remember from what we just read, from what I just talked about? Good job. Yes. Nucleus, mitochondrion. And let's do ER because that one's easy. Now you, of course, can write whatever ones you would like to write. You can write all of them. All right. The next question is, what is the mitochondrion and its function? All right, so we just talked about it. Hopefully it's fresh in your head. The mitochondrion is the organelle that is the power house where cellular respiration occurs, releasing energy. All right, again, pause that if you need to copy it. But we've got to move on. All right, next up is what is the job of the nucleus in a eukaryotic cell? 
So what job does a nucleus do? And that is just to remind you that eukaryotic cells are cells that have the DNA in a nucleus instead of just floating loosely inside the cell. So what's the job of the nucleus? The nucleus is the right. It's the control center. It directs all the activities of the cell. The nucleus tells the cell when to do what, and it also stores the DNA. That's where the genetic material of the cell is stored, is there in the nucleus. Again, pause it if you need to, but I'm moving on. Are you eukaryote versus prokaryote? What does it mean? So I just told you, right? What's it mean? Right. So a eukaryote has DNA inside the nucleus. <clears throat> now you, of course, are going to need to type this word in the box down here, but I'm trying to save time. And then you're going to type this word. A prokaryote does not have a nucleus. The DNA floats in the cell. So there's no nucleus in the center of the cell keeping all the DNA together. It just floats around. All right. Again, you know, pause, right? Okay. All right, we're going to put this in the correct order from smallest to largest. I've got organism, cell, system, tissue, and organ. So which one is the smallest thing up there? That's right. Good job. Cell. All right. So it's cell. And then we put a bunch of cells together. If we stack cells together, we get tissue. And if we put a bunch of tissue together, we get an organ. So if it's lung tissue, we make a lung. If it's heart tissue, we make a heart. If it's brain tissue, we make a brain. If we put a bunch of organs together, they create an organ system. So um, if we take your lungs as the organ and then put it together with the other organs, uh, your trachea, your, uh, your mouth, um, your, your, well, your heart, <laughs> it becomes the cardiopulmonary system. Um, if we start with the organ of your stomach and then we add the other organs in that system, the esophagus, your large and small intestine, blah, 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 your mouth. That's the digestive system. All right, well, what if we put a bunch of systems together? We've got a nervous system plus a digestive system plus a, a cardiopulmonary system plus an adrenal system plus an augmentary system, skin, and we get a person or a living thing, right? We get an organism. Once we put all those body systems together, we make a whole living thing. All right, pause, make sure you get that written down. Move it on. All right, so I want this put into a food chain. Um, I want you to add other organisms to make a food web. You're gonna label um, the producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, and tertiary consumer. All right, so first you're gonna need to add in, you're gonna have to type next to each of these to add it, well not first, but when we're done, you're going to have to add in that primary, secondary, etc. All right, so where are we going to start? The energy is coming from the sun. What's the first thing that's absorbing that energy and turning it into to chemical energy in its cells? That's right, the corn. So that is our producer then because that's the plant. That's the thing that is gathering sun and making energy from it. So we've got corn. And then what's going to eat the corn? So of our list here, the only thing that's going to eat any corn is a rat. So a rat is our primary consumer because primary means first and consumer means to eat. So the rat eats the corn, <clears throat> so he's the primary consumer. Now, what's going to eat the rat? Well, let's say the copperhead eats the rat. So... Copperhead eats the rat, and look, I'm putting commas because that's what you're going to type, but it should be arrows because it's showing the flow of energy, all right? But you're putting a comma because I'm not making you put arrows for your typing here. 
All right, so that means the copperhead is our secondary consumer because he's the second one to eat something instead of making its own energy. And then king snakes eat copperheads. So the king snake is going to eat the copperhead. And again, you're putting a comma, but it should be an arrow. And so that means that the king snake is the tertiary consumer because he's the third one to eat. Consumer. And then last, the hawk. The hawk will eat the king snake. And that makes the hawk the quaternary. I don't even have that up there, but there it is. Quaternary consumer. Now it says to then add more organisms to make a food web. So the first thing you wouldn't even need to add organisms to make a food web. Um, the king snake and the rat and the hawk will both also eat the rat. So the rat could go to the copperhead, to the king snake, or to the hawk. So there's the beginnings of your web because yes, you've got your um, straight line here, but then you've also got kind of a web going on. Now to really make it a web, we would need to add mouse. We would need to add other birds. We need to add other foods. Um, I'm not going to make you do that for this. If you manage to watch this video, aren't you lucky? You get to just skip on that one and just write down what's up here. All right. So the next thing is just a picture of um, a couple of food chains because I just wanted to show you what they look like, um, what you might see on the on the SOL. All right, so um, here we've got a food chain where it's starting with grass, and then we've got a grasshopper, a hornet eating the flowers, you know, eating the, the grass, and then we've got other bigger insects eating those insects, and then the frog eats those bigger insects, the snake eats the frog, and then the hawk eats the snake. And then here we've got uh, plankton, tiny little single-celled organisms, things, algae or whatever, um, actually, no, these are the plankton. So these are like it's supposed to be algae. These are supposed to be microorganisms. And then these are jellyfish and other tiny little um, krill, um, tiny little living things, little animals. And then slightly bigger animals like small fish, shrimp, and crabs. And then those get eaten by bigger fish. And then those get eaten by a dolphin. And then I don't know how often this is not right, y'all. Dolphins attack sharks all the time. They don't eat them that I know of, but there's like, yeah, dolphin sharks are afraid of dolphins that I don't know if I agree with so much. There aren't that many dolphins that get eaten by sharks. You can check it out on your own though. All right. Next question. What are the two main classification groups for plants and what do those names mean? Um, this is one where I usually try to get you to dig deep and uh and remember um but i don't have anybody in the room with me right now so vascular and non-vascular and all it means is has tubes so plants that have tubes um can be tall so pretty much every plant you can think of if you think of a plant it's going to be a vascular plant, an apple tree, a flower, corn, all the food we eat, uh, grass, all that stuff are vascular plants. Non-vascular plants do not have tubes. So that means they can't get very tall. They're very short. Um, often you'll see vascular plants growing near, <clears throat> like by the side of the creek or um, at a waterfall where there's moisture in the air all the time, you might see a whole lot of non-vascular plants, but um, they've got to be near water because they don't have any tubes to bring the water up from the roots. So the, the plant has to be able to get water in the short little, short little area. So this is going to be moss, lichens, and warts. And on the next slide, um, I've got some pictures to show you. So pause, get those written down, and then um, we'll look at pictures. Well, I thought. 
Unless I just skipped it again. There we go. Okay, so um, this is moss. This one right here is moss. And you've seen that all over the place. And this one's lichens. You're probably pretty familiar with that because that's um, something that grows on lots of trees around here and everything. These are warts. So that's a horn. Uh, that's a. These two are both horn warts. And then that's a liver wart. And it's just a tiny little plant. Um, and it's not W-A-R-T, it's W-O-R-T. And I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, where the name came from. Uh, someone science-y. Yeah. All right. So what are the two main types of vascular plants? Describe them. So we just said that vascular plants are the plants that have tubes. And mostly, if you think of a plant, it's going to be a vascular plant. But so that must mean that we've got this huge group where all vascular plants are not the same. So we're going to keep on classifying. You know, scientists, we love to classify things. So there are two main types of vascular plants, and they both end in a word that tends to make middle schoolers giggle. You remember this? I don't know if you got a chance to talk about it last year in seventh grade with the craziness, but angiosperms and gymnosperms. Yes, no. All right, so gymnosperm means naked seed. That's like the direct translation from uh, from Greek, Latin, Greek, Latin. Most medical terms are uh, Greek and most science terms are Latin, but sometimes they mix. So I think it's Greek but it might be Latin. It doesn't really matter. Anyway, that's what it means, naked seed. And so this is going to be our, the evergreens, you know, the, the trees that, um, that don't lose their leaves in the fall. Um, evergreens, evergreens. Uh, they're going to be cone bearing. So that's where the naked seed comes from is that the seed is, is not inside of a fruit. It's not, you know, inside of any kind of fleshy anything. It's just inside the cone. And when the cone pops open, there's the seed. There's nothing, nothing protecting it. Um, I've got, that's bothering me. Okay. Um, so these are the trees. There are, these are the types of plants, and they're usually trees. They're usually, you know, a fir tree, pine tree, that kind of thing. And then angiosperms is everything else. So it means covered seed. So pretty much any plant, like once you've decided that it's vascular, and then you think of a plant again, it's probably going to be an angiosperm. And unless you're thinking about a pine tree, you know, most of the time, if you're thinking about food, if you're thinking about, you know, whatever, it's going to be an angiosperm. So all of our food crops um that have uh fruit um and remember that things like um cucumber that's the fruit of the plant so that's a fruit i know you know you don't want to put that in your fruit salad but just like a tomato is a fruit a cucumber is technically the fruit of the plant peas are the fruit of the plant um it's yeah so all, almost all food crops um now sometimes the food crops the part that we're eating is the leaves or the roots or the stems like celery we eat the stems lettuce and spinach we eat the leaves uh carrots we eat the root um for potatoes we're actually eating a specialized underground stem it's not actually the root of the plant it's a stem that's storing food in it but so most most of our food crops oh well no but they're all they're still angiosperms because they still have a covered seed we may not eat the seed but it's still going to be an angiosperm um sure some people eat pine nuts but it's not common um, so all the flowers, anything that's flowering, anything that grows a flower ever, if it makes a flower, then it's an angiosperm. All right. Again, pause if you need to. Oh, this is taking forever, but it's okay. We're doing good review here. All right. And that apparently that slide was in the wrong spot. So there is one major vertebrate phylum. We just talked about it a little while ago. Do you remember what it was called? Good job, Chordata. Is there only one invertebrate phylum? 
And if no, how many are there and what are some of them called? So is there only one invertebrate? Wouldn't it be nice if, if that would have been like kingdom animals, phylum, chordata, invertebrata. Wouldn't that have been great? But that's not what they did. There are actually eight and some argue nine invertebrate phyla. Um, and if we were in class, I would have people hollering out and telling me what they could remember. But this is Miss Harris trying to remember. So we've got sponges, and that's called periphera is the fancy name for it. We've got nadarians, which are like the jellyfish and stuff like that. Nadarians. Nadarians. I think that's right. Um, we've got mollusks. So um, that's where all the bivalves are, which includes squid and uh, octopus, octopi. Um, we've got flatworms. We've got roundworms. We've got segmented worms. And all of those are in their own phylum. Uh, what am I missing? Starfish and that are nadarians. Oh, I feel like I'm missing something. I know I'm missing something because I only have six, but what are some of them called? If you want to look up more of them, I, they're, they're buried in my brain someplace, but we need to keep going. All right, so write that down. Moving on. Why is this taking so long? It takes just long enough for me to think that it's not working. Name the six kingdoms and give two examples of each. So I want to know what the six kingdoms are. So the one that we are in, animal kingdom. Then the one we like the most to eat, the plant kingdom. Then we also tend to like to use fungus in our cooking. We also use fungus for lots of things. We use fungus to cure diseases and to kill bacteria. So let's talk about bacteria. There's the eubacteria uh, kingdom. Then we've got protists. And then these are all in the domain. I don't know what the domain is called. Eukarya, I think. And then we've got Arche bacteria as our last kingdom, and those are those old ancient bacteria. All right, so and animal examples. Well, that should be easy enough. I'm not even going to give you any, okay? You have to think of two animals all on your own. <laughs> you can do it. Same thing for plants. I'm not gonna name plants for you. I've already named plants for you earlier. Go back if you need. A reminder of some plants, but type in two plants. Then for fungus, all right, so of course mushrooms, and if you want to get specific and name two types of mushrooms, that's fine, but yeast is also fungi. Mold and mildew are fungus, okay? Uh, you bacteria are the bacteria that you've heard of. So what are some of the bacteria that you've heard of that make us sick? Okay, good job. E. coli is a type of bacteria that we know of that makes us sick. What else? Yep, strep. Strep throat is definitely something that makes us sick, and that's caused by a bacteria. All right, what about protists, protista? We need two, at least protists. And I've been trying to give you a little hints all throughout the year. Hopefully somebody. Oh, good job. Yes, amoebas. So amoeba. I feel like Dora the Explorer, y'all forgive me. All right, so amoebas, um, euglena, paramecium. Those are all protists. And then archaebacteria, I'm not going to ask you to actually name any because it doesn't really matter. Um, but you need to know that there are ones that are salt loving or um, sulfur loving or heat loving uh, or cold loving. Um, there are bacteria that can live in places that we didn't think anything could live. There's some kind of bacteria living there doing its thing, loving it. All right, pause it, copy down what you need. I'm moving on. And this is going to take forever, and I'm going to feel like it's not going to happen. 
And then, okay, so it says, what is a biome? Name as many as you can. All right, so what is a biome? We just talked about it earlier, so hopefully it's still ringing in your noggin. What's a biome? Good job. It's a bunch of ecosystems with similar climate and organisms over a large area. All right, I want you to name as many as you can. So I'm not gonna type anything else on this slide because you are going to name as many as you can. So this is not done. You've got to fill this in. You've got to name as many as you can. Now, I have given you a little help. All right, so pause and write that much down if you need to. But I have given you a little help on the next slide. Um, I've given you an infographic, perhaps. There we go. So there's a, you can just copy those down. You know, but there we are. Those are the world's biomes. And yeah. Okay. What is meant by the nitrogen cycle and how much of our air is nitrogen? So the nitrogen cycle, I'm actually going to go ahead and advance to the next slide. So the nitrogen cycle, we need nitrogen. Our bodies are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen and sulfur. So chons, not chins, but chons. CH, right? Carbon, hydrogen. Ah, O, oxygen. N, nitrogen. S, sulfur. So we need nitrogen. It's a big part of us. And there's 78% of the air that we breathe in is nitrogen. But we can't use it. We breathe it right back out. It's crazy. So how do we get it? We get it from the food we eat. So how does that happen? There are actually these bacteria. They're called nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And they live in the soil. They live in the roots of the plants. And they can literally grab the nitrogen out of the air and fix it into the ground. Um, they convert the nitrogen from gas into nitrates which puts the nitrogen into minerals and things that the, that the plant can suck into its, uh, into its cells. And then when we eat the plant, we get the nitrogen. Um, okay, so that answered the question. So now we gotta write it down. The nitrogen cycle explains how bacteria, and you know what, we're gonna, they're special bacteria. Special bacteria are able to grab nitrogen out of the air and fix it into the soil. And then the question is, how much of our air is nitrogen? Do you remember what I said? Yep, 78% nitrogen, our air. All right, again, pause that. All right, so for this one, I didn't want to have to reinvent the wheel, so I just used the picture from something that already existed. So there's actually two questions here. I want you to put the symbols in sequence in the order in which they evolved and then do the same for the organisms. So A is a plus, B is a plus inside a circle, inside a triangle, C is a plus inside a circle, and D is a minus sign. So if you're thinking about evolution, you're gonna be thinking about from simplest to most complex. So our simplest symbol up there is the plain minus sign. So down here in the bot, there should be a text box down here at the bottom right here. So in that box, you're gonna type D. And then, all right, so we use that one. So what comes next? So if uh, of what we've got left, A is the next most simple because you just added another bar going across this way. 
And then C is going to come next because we added the circle around the plus. And then last is going to be B because it has the most complicated stuff going on. All right. And then for the second one, the um, most, uh, the, the, the sequence in the order in which they evolved. So the least evolved thing up here are ancient bacteria, our archaea bacteria, which we believe are the basis of pretty much everything. Everything kind of, kind of had to evolve from that. And then next up is going to be the plant-like protists. because That's the next most complicated thing. And then it's possible that those uh, got together in, uh, in clumps and ended up making algae. And then the next most complicated thing is seaweed because seaweed is just algae that's joined together. And then lastly, sea grass is the most complicated thing up there. All right, pause it if you need to. I think that's it. Well, it's not it, but it's it for this video because I've got another video. Nope. Still got to talk about this one. All right. How many chromosomes does a normal human skin cell have? And then how about a gamete? So you have to know what a gamete is. And this is one of those things where you know darn well that half of your DNA came from your mom and half of your DNA came from your dad. And you know from where it came. You know that your mom had an egg cell, dad had a sperm cell, and that's what made you. But you don't know what a gamete is. Well, that's a gamete. A gamete is a reproductive cell. A gamete is a sex cell. So either a sperm or an egg. So you've got to think about how many chromosomes does a normal human skin cell have? So like if I took a, a, a cell from my skin, my heart, my brain, anywhere, it's going to have all of the DNA that makes me me. If I had students in the room, I would say, does anybody know the number? And sometimes people know, but it's okay if you don't. But it's 46 chromosomes in any non-reproductive cell. So heart cell, lung cell, brain cell, um, as long as it's a human who is uh, genetically normal. Um, there are some people that have different amounts of chromosomes, but they've got some pretty serious issues that they have to deal with because of it as well. It causes a lot of health issues. Um, so 46 chromosomes is in any non-reproductive cell in the body. So skin, uh, heart, lung, whatever you're talking about, it's going to have 46 chromosomes. So if half came from your mom and half came from your dad, and you already know that a gamete is a reproductive cell. Well, what's half of 46? Exactly. It has 23 chromosomes. So you've got 23 chromosomes from your mom and 23 chromosomes from your dad. And then those two pairs match up and whichever thing is more dominant or more recessive, uh, whatever thing is more dominant is the thing that we see. The recessive gene is still there, but we don't see it. And we'll talk more about that in the next video. All right, so you're going to pause and get that written down. All right, what's the difference between mitosis and meiosis? So um, mitosis, uh, as we've talked about before, is a cell copying itself. And it's used for growth and healing. And it happens everywhere in the body. And when we're done, we're going to have an exact copy of the parent cell. Meiosis, or meiosis, some people pronounce it that way. I'm, I'm not even sure which one is quote unquote correct. I think it just depends on who was your biology teacher. But meiosis is only used in reproductive cells. So the only place that my meiosis occurs is in the reproductive organs to produce reproductive cells. Um, it's used to reproduce. I mean, that's, that's what these cells are for. Um, it makes gametes, it makes sex cells. 
and we're going to get a cell, the, the daughter cell has half the number of chromosomes. of a parent cell. So in a human, that's 23. And um, they're also scrambled up. So imagine if when reproductive cells were being made and uh, all it did was take one of your mom's cells and just literally take the two copies that are there and pull them apart and then stick them into a, a gamete. You and your siblings would be identical. And then you and uncles and aunts and all that would be identical because it would just be pulling it apart and putting it back together like a zipper. And that's not what happens. There are these little proteins that move the code around so that we have genetic variation. So not only does it have half the number of chromosomes, it's not even a, a copy of half. There's going to be stuff that's gotten moved around. I mean, you don't want to look exactly like your sister, right? Like... Varieties of spice of life. Okay. I know you're going to pause and get that copy down. I know from the fact that this thing has been messing up on me all day and advancing too far that this is the next thing. And so that means that um, you are going to pause here now and you're going to watch the video that's on the iCard up there, which is really going to give you an intro into this. Okay. And then you're going to come back. You're going to get like halfway through that video. And then after you get a little lesson on genetics, and then you're going to come back and do this. And then you're going to go into the gen dragon genetics, which that video will help you to do. So the next thing in the folder is the dragon genetics. And that video is going to help you do the dragon genetics. And it's also going to help you to understand this. So really seriously, like pause the video and go watch that one. Because you're not going to get this. You're not going to understand it. Okay. All right. Welcome back. Okay. So you all, you understand genetics. You understand dominant and recessive. You know that the father of genetics now was Gregor Mendel. You know all those things. So now we can do this. So we're going to complete a cross of a heterozygous short-haired dog and a homozygous long-haired dog. So we know that hetero means different and homo means same. So we know that this dog's code for short hair um is uh going to be the mix of our codes and that the long-haired dog is going to have the same code and we also can tell that short hair is dominant because it's what we see in the heterozygous one so we're just going to make up letters um we'll, we'll use s's okay so we'll use capital s for short hair and lowercase s for long hair so it's a heterozygous so it's a mix and then we've got our homozygous long hair. So it's going to be two lowercase s's because it has long hair. And then we're going to cross them up just like we did in the other video. So big s, little s. And then over here, little and little. And then big and little. And then little and little. And the question is, what's the phenotype uh, and genotype ratio? So the genotype ratio is heterozygous short to uh, homozygous long, and it's a one-to-one -one ratio because we have two of these and we have two of these. Then the phenotype ratio the phenotype ratio is of course going to be the way it looks. So these two have short hair and these two have long hair. So we have short long and again it's a one-to-one -one ratio because it's a two-to-two -two ratio and that boils down to one-to-one -to -one. okay sharing instructions are there on the next slide um once you have shared it with me you're going to um once you shared it with me you're going to finish up your watching the dragon genetics video and do your dragon genetics project and again that video I linked it and I'll probably link it again here at the end. All right. Have a lovely day. Make good decisions. Bye.